Hello, this is They Made Us, the podcast in which we talk to inspirational people about the people who have inspired them. Some of them may well be real, some of them might possibly be uh, fictional. That's the people who've inspired them, not the people who are guests. So we might have some fictional guests. We should have some be fictional quite guests. Nice. Yeah. yeah, with all this AI debate, debate I'm sure there's some Oh, we don't want to fiction. get into deep fakes. No, don't too worry, soon. we're too not. Uh, I, uh, and uh, obviously I'm, I'm joined by uh, Helen Chersky again, who's, uh, cover- well, latest book, is uh, Blue Machine, isn't it? Which yes. is uh, the it's out about soon. yeah. Well, in fact, it will be out. I reckon by the time this goes out. So oh, right. this is part of the thing we're playing with here at this very moment now. The block universe. What you've right. said is both in the future and in the past, and possibly in the present at the same time. You spend too much time with Brian. You know that. No, oh, he hates conversations like that. <laughs> I spend too much time dreaming of Philip K. Dick. It's only an electronic <laughs> Philip K. Dick, not the real one. Obviously, I haven't got that kind of money. Um, so you've. Got, I wanted to ask you before we introduce our guest as well, which is about when you got really cross oh, yeah. on stage at the Albert <laughs> Hall about something that people. Say about the oceans. I do. And well, I, it's funny I that you remember this. You were like, the time you got cross. Well, no, I mean, there's lots of them, obviously, because you work with me quite a lot and I'm difficult. But <laughs> what was, uh, but that time in particular, because I loved it and other people were slightly like, this, this, was, a, this was your moment from, you know, the, the film Network. You were mad as hell and you weren't going to take it anymore. People came up after me and said, oh, well, you were a bit cross, are you OK? And I'm like, no, 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 because the thing is that when you stamp your foot on the stage at the Royal Albert Hall, it's a good stamp. Um, so I was getting very animated about this thing that people say, which drives me nuts. And no one should ever be allowed to say it, which is that we know more about the, the surface of the moon or the Mars, whichever it is that day, than we know about the deep ocean. And it is not true. And it drives me nuts. And <laughs> I show, this is the short version of the rant. Just imagine the full length one. Um, but partly it, like, it's because it's a, such a false comparison. Like the moon is perfectly nice. It's not changed for two billion years. There's no atmosphere. It doesn't really do very much at the moment. It's very important. It's not, it's the, you know, there's a limit to what there is to know about it. And Chris Lintart is sitting next to me laughing. Let me have my rant. Um, but, you know, the ocean is not only has a shape of the surface, it's got, it's got water and it's got life and it's doing things. And there are worms down there that have a thousand anuses and the anuses swim off to the surface to do the mating while the worm stays behind, right? You do not get that on the moon, even in novels by, you know, the great sci-fi authors of the past. And so, and it's like, the, it's an engine that's doing stuff. And so I think it's just such a false equivalence because it kind of says, you know those pictures of the moon where basically they went to the moon and the only interesting things to take pictures of were the Earth and the astronauts. If you look at those pictures, the moon is never the focus of the pictures. Um, well, the deep ocean's just like that. It's just a bit empty. It's, it's like our picture of the void. And that's not what the ocean is. And I wrote a whole book to get this run out, basically. But, but this is... So it, it's I just think a pop-up book now that you open and it punches you directly in the face <laughs> just saves a lot of time well there's another option there's a question at the start is do you think the moon should be compared to think yes you know that it's, you, you get a chance see I, I still think you're entirely wrong about what people are saying when they say that or maybe it's them that, but but i when someone says that think what's being said is the ocean is so fascinating and the moon is more boring. And so what they're actually saying is the moon's, up, which as we know, you know, Apollo 8 astronauts, the reason we have the great image Earthrise is because they got a bit bored. They went, oh, the moon, is that what it looks like? Boring. And then they looked out the window and went, there's where we live. And they got kind of excited by that. So I think you're looking at it from the wrong way around. But I think the whole point about, you know, we can have a long Oh, by the way, our guests can leave now. It seems <laughs> that we've started something. <laughs> But the, the thing about this is, we're going back to the moon, you know, Artemis is coming, people are going to go back. And they, it was only when people went as far away as the moon that they looked back and saw a blue planet. And then they talked about a blue planet for 50 years. And then they never thought about the blue. They were just like, oh, we live on a blue planet. That's fine. Let's carry on talking about the land, which is perfectly nice. But it's definitely not the whole picture. And so I think this time when we go back to the moon, it is really important that we look at the ocean and say, oh, we live on a blue planet. This is what that means. It's not just blue, you know, 
in between the interesting bits. The blue is the entire point. Um, what if we get to the short... moon and they get there and they go, oh my goodness, look, I've just seen there's a thousand tiny poos that all seem to have come from the same creature. The 1,000 sphinctered animal does exist. Well, you know and then the they... ocean becomes a bit boring then, doesn't it? Well, if it? they go to the, look, if they go to the moon and find octopuses, which are an independently involved intelligence, and it turns out that Von Daniken was right after all, and the octopuses came down yeah. to Earth from the, you know, and that was the start of intelligent life on Earth, then I'm happy to be proved wrong. Well, but I do until know, that yeah. point... Chris <laughs> Lintott is, is a big fan of the hollow moon theory, which says that there is a kind of H.P. Lovecraft-style Cthulhu that lives we within it. We should probably introduce uh, the hollow earth in a second. Yeah, so guests. that is... Uh, so for, well, today we are joined by uh, a structural engineer who spent six years building what is, is ultimately, I think, the uh, most fascinating 21st century building in London, the Shard, uh, and also keenly encourages us to uh, both stroke concrete and contemplate bricks, both of which I agree with on that, and that is Roma Agrawal. And we are also joined by someone who is uh, a wonderful astronomer who spends a lot of time encouraging everyone to get involved in uh, the Zooniverse project where we can all kind of begin to learn things about the shapes of galaxies and planets, etc. And also is someone who once said to me, the trouble with the universe is ultimately it does get a bit samey. Uh, <laughs> and that is Chris is Lintock. Late. I don't like the moon either. <laughs> Uh, because it gets in the way. I want to look at the rest of the universe. So half the time, we have, when you apply for time in a, a telescope, you can have dark nights or grey nights. And no one wants the grey nights, because that's when the moon is above the horizon, and it ruins everything. So I would get rid of the moon instantly, um, <laughs> even if there are octopuses Which on it. Which ruins, of course, the seaside holiday trade. It does. Because the end of the tides is going to have some ramifications, well, surely. The other point is, yeah, you see, the power in the oceans does come partly Look, from the moon. A, no? a lot of the energy in the oceans, yeah. the reason it's mixed up, comes from the so moon. So they'd be so more no, dull without saying, the moon. I'm not saying we shouldn't have it. I'm not an extremist in this. You know, I'm, ha <laughs> I'm happy for there to be a moon. I just think that we ought to be, you know, looking at the ocean a bit more. What, let's do both. Let's I think there's the time first. for both. Yeah. Um, Roma, I want to start just with, before, before we get on to, to, to those who've, who've inspired you, I loved, when I first read an interview where you talked about contemplating walls and contemplating bricks, because it is something that I genuinely really, I don't know when it happened, a few years ago I was at Darlington Station, I don't know if you know it, it's got... My it's, husband was born there. Ah, oh, well it has got a... Hang on, uh, hang, hang on, hang on, hang on. Just, your husband was born in Darlington Station. Yes, it's a northern version of the importance of being uh, earnest. Don't you know about this? <laughs> um, but it is, that's, that wall is so big, so red-bricked, so, and I remember having this moment, which was genuinely trans, kind of a transcendent moment, of thinking about all the hands that had gone into placing those bricks and thinking about all the minds that had gone into thinking about how the station should be built. So is that part of the way that we should try and muse on the buildings around us? Um, yeah, so I talk about an engineer's X-ray vision because I think like everything around us is super cool, um, cooler than the oceans, I might just... <laughs> this is all just going to turn into a big fight, isn't it, really? <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, the human hand is, is fascinating with bricks, for example, but I actually think about the fossils because the clay that's used to make the bricks in the first place can be up to 50 million years old. Um, so, that, you know, I live in a brick house in London. It's made from London clay. London clay is up to 50 million years old. And, and so I often think, like, what are the fragments of life or once life that are in the bricks of my house, which... I can now touch, and that kind of blows my mind. I love that. It's like I, I was brought up in the Chilterns and just thinking about the hills, and it was only when I was an adult that I started to understand what chalk was and this sense of going to be walking across an ocean floor, but no longer an ocean floor, and to be that all of that chalk is, you know, move, that there is life. So, yeah, so that, that sense of looking into the life that exists within the brick is... is yeah. Yeah, so, so I think this is what I'm trying to do with my life now. I, w I was just having this conversation with Helen downstairs, like, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. Um, but, but I think that's what it is, because I spent so long, and, you know, designing the shard was very cool, I'm not going to lie, but it also involved months and months of sitting and designing multiple steel beams a million times and lots of nuts and bolts, which, you know, we can talk about for hours. Um, but then I started thinking, well, there must be like a history and a story to all of this stuff, which I don't, well, first of all, I was never taught. So, you know, you don't come across the humans behind the stuff when we're being taught 
physics or engineering or whatever. I mean, I'm sure that's sort of changing now, but it suddenly wasn't the case when I was studying. Um, so, yeah, so, so people, the people that are designing the stuff, the people we're designing things for, how we interact with that. What is the impact of all of this stuff on power structures, on society, on racism, colonialism, slavery, like all kinds of stuff that we, we wouldn't associate engineering with enslavement, perhaps, but they are inextricably linked. And so it's these kind of links and stories that I'm really fascinated with now and that I've explored, particularly... Um, in in my new book nuts and bolts that's that that intersectional idea is such a i remember seeing an an amazing piece of uh, uh art which was just called sugar skulls mm. and it was the skulls of those people who would have been those who were exploited and killed so that we had sugar and that bit again of making those connections i think that, sorry yeah no i was going to say that one of the stories that really struck me um, that I found when I was researching this. So this is about seven small inventions that changed the world. And the first one is the nail. And my argument is that the shard wouldn't have existed without something like the nail, because the nail became the screw, the rivet, the nut and bolt. And of course, it's nuts and bolts that hold all the steel up together. Um, and so if any of you do go to the viewing gallery in the shard, you know, just forget about the Thames, you know, which is the sludgy brown river. As uh, it's your you know. objection, Your Honour. Um, oh, come on, you do oceans, that. not rivers. It's an estuary. Oh. How much... Oh. Okay, the estuary, <laughs> full of poo, um, which I'm not going to take any arguments against. Um, forget about all of that stuff and just look up at the nuts and bolts, because I think that's where the real story is. And I was exploring kind of the figures in history that were involved in the story of the nail, and Thomas Jefferson came up founding father of the US, president. Um, and then what I found was just seven years before he became president, he had 400 enslaved boys and men on his plantation in Monticello, making between eight and 10,000 nails for him every day. And he was selling those basically to fund his family's lifestyle while the soils in his plantation were depleted. So it's those kind of stories that I really kind of want to bring out to the front because that, that connection between society, power structures and engineering is not one I think that we think about a lot. And is it, did you know, did you sort of know what you were going looking for before you started? Or did you, did you kind of, you thought there was something there and then you went digging and then you kind of went, oh, this, you know, how much did you know beforehand? I, I, I guess there's, there's the inkling that the stories are there. What the stories are, you're not so sure. And then it becomes this huge discovery. Um, sounds very cliched, but it is genuinely, you just start digging at these little things and you have this little itch and you go, oh, I'll just want to in investigate that a little bit more. And it just kind of carries on from there. And I really felt like I could have written a book about any one of the seven objects because there's just so much stuff there. Um, and so I got to be very selective about the stories that I tell and um, we'll come to it. But the second guest that I've picked was actually a, a very recent discovery and we'll, you know, we can obviously discuss why I picked him. Well, maybe we should get to your first guest in that case. Yeah, yeah let's so do it. So who's your first guest? So my first guest is um, a woman called Emily Warren Roebling. Um, I've written a whole chapter on her in my first book, Built. So the reason I picked her was because, so I, I mentioned before that you know, while we're studying and stuff, we don't really learn about engineers. If there were names mentioned, they were all old white men that are dead and have been kind of put on a pedestal. Um, so if you, t if you think about the Brooklyn Bridge in New York, which was one of the most iconic structures of its time, it was the longest bridge of, at the time. It was the longest suspension bridge in the world for decades. Um, and then how many of us know that there was a woman behind that? You know, which, which it's just incredible. So she um, was lucky enough, I guess, privileged enough to get a decent education growing up as a girl in the 1800s. And she married an engineer and her father-in-law was an illustrious engineer. Father-in-law died because of an accident on the site of the Brooklyn Bridge, even before they actually started building it. And then her husband became very disabled and incapacitated because of working on the construction site. And so she was almost forced into this position where she said, you know, my family's legacy is going to be lost. So she started, first of all, just trying to download her husband's brain, I think, trying to make notes of all the stuff he knew. Um, what do we need to do with this bit, that bit? What are the materials? Who's going to supply this, whatever? And she just started doing notes. But by the end of it, she was project managing the thing, the biggest bridge in the world at the time. And she did it for 11 years. 
And what kind of response did she get? I mean, she, she, that must have been quite a, you know, an eye-opening thing for New York society um, at the time. Quite a lot of sarcasm, I would say. Um, so she had to very much hide behind her husband's name and said, oh, no, 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 I'm just kind of supporting him. It's, you know, it's not me. Um, but then there were kind of these slightly sarcastic news articles written about her at the time saying that, you know, the handwriting of a woman has become a regular feature in the offices on site, kind of making these sideways references to the fact that she's the one writing in, solving the problems or whatever. Um, they wanted to, the, the kind of political powers that be, the funders wanted to remove her husband as chief engineer, because he was always chief engineer throughout the whole project, even when he was incapacitated. And she went in and said, no, he's doing great. He's fine. Yes, he's disabled, but I'm there to kind of interpret his work. And she very much downplayed her contribution to make sure that she was allowed to do the project. Um, she did go on construction sites, which I'm prob was probably completely unheard of at the time. She interacted with the laborers, with the politicians, with the funders, like every kind of strata of type of person that was involved in the project she was involved with. And... What an incredible story. And did she get recognition at the time? And this is an interesting thing. Is you, you hear these stories, you're like, well, what happened afterwards? You know, what, so what, did, did she, was she able to carry that on? What, did she ever get recognition in her lifetime for what she did? And what I, did her husband think about it? Yeah, so her husband was actually, I, from what my understanding is, it was, in, was supportive and had a lot of respect and recognition for what she had done. Um, he was asked what he thought his wife's biggest contribution to the project was, and he talked about her role as a peacemaker. And I, I think, it's, some people think that that downplays what she did, but I think there's a very nuanced, very important point there, which is she knew how to deal with people, which is such an important skill for an engineer, again, something we don't really talk about. Um, then somebody put up a plaque next to one of the um, towers of the bridge in the, more, in the 20th century, and it talks about behind the man is the self-serving devotion of a woman type words. I can't remember exactly what it says, which exactly that expression, uh, you know, slight frown, slight kind of what? Is, is this supposed to be? Provide your references. That's what I'd say. Cite your sources. <laughs> um, you know, is that supposed to be flattering to her? I don't really understand. Um, and then when I was researching her story, there are certain books which mention her as like a side note or a footnote there are certain books where like no she actually made a really big contribution to it and then certain books she's not mentioned at all however being I guess a woman with a little bit of privilege white they had a bit of money in the family and so on so her name did kind of eventually appear and then I guess the question remains like of the women who have completely lost to history you know we can only know about the women that have had some kind of legacy come on there but yeah so, she, so we do know a bit about her she would, then went on to do a law degree and was a suffragette so she never did engineering again that was very much of its time and the circumstance but she was definitely I think quite a strong character who didn't just sit there and how much did you empathise with, you know, you, you worked as an engineer and so you're looking at the story of an engineer, you know, decades, more than a century. Yeah. When was it built? Brooklyn, 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 1860 Brooklyn. something. Okay. So, so, you know, I'm say. <laughs> a long time ago. And how much of her story did you think, oh, we still see that today? How much did you empathise with? Yeah, so unfortunately, more than I would have hoped, I think, on one hand, you're like this, you know, she was a woman engineer so many years ago, and of course things have come on, but early on in my career, so I mean, I graduated and started working on construction projects in 2005, 2006, so we're going back a few years now, but I, would, I was still the only woman on site for a while I would still go on site and there would be naked pictures of women on the walls and then I have to go there and have a serious conversation I didn't feel like I had the place or empowerment to speak up about this stuff because I felt like people all the men would basically just say oh you know this is why we don't want women on site because they come here and start complaining about all the boobs that we've got on display um and so there was definite like a level of discomfort which I'm sure she felt in a, in a very different way but also in a similar way um so, yes, yeah, so unfortunately, there were a lot of parallels that you would think, a, you know, a woman kind of 150 okay, okay. years on shouldn't 
You know what bugs me? It's it's the um, it's the survival gear and the personal protective equipment. When I work on ships, and they the first thing you do when you walk, step onto a ship you're going to work on for a while is they all they make you practice putting on survival suits, which is basically a sort of giant onesie that will keep you alive if you fall in the ocean. They're not particularly flattering things, but they are made for mariners who are six foot five and weigh, you know, many, many, many kilos. And you get women, and I'm not, you know, I'm above average height for a, for a woman in this, in this country, uh, considerably above average height. And I'm just drowning in, like, yeah, I'm drowning in the thing that's supposed to stop me from drowning. And, I mean, you probably shouldn't get, get, and life vests, right? They give you these life vests, which are not made for people with and breasts, kind of right? Come up to and like they kind yeah. And it's like these, it's like the little things that you wouldn't necessarily, it's not even just attitudes. Like the engineering world is still quite, it's not quite got there, you know. I, yeah. yeah but that was true of spacesuits, wasn't I was it? Just yeah. Yeah. Recently, you know, the, yeah. the, the, there was a, the, uh, you know, it was basically made for male astronauts. And then you start to get, I mean, so I've always found that fascinating that the Russians were so much further ahead in terms of having female right. cosmonauts as opposed to, you know, America, which was meant to be a progressive society. And, then they go, hang on a minute. I mean, especially when you're, you know, this isn't just you drowning. This is someone going to space for weeks, yeah. months. And, then, and, you know, and, and the first stuff they're stuck in is, is kind of, yeah, and, yeah, which I just find... And the slight irony of this is that the Apollo-era spacesuits were made by Playtex. Um, because they were the people with the textile expertise and they needed that particular expertise. They're these beautiful stories. It's an engineering thing, but trying to connect... NASA engineering, which requires a change log. Every time you make any alteration to a design, you get approval from Committee 4 and submit Form 17B or whatever. And then people working with needles to fit to a customer who's the astronaut. And so the two organisations really struggled. There's a brilliant book by an architect about this struggle between the two and adjusting on both sides to the fact that this was a just as powerful as the sort of traditional mode of aerospace engineering, but needed to change. And on the other hand, things like the people sewing the suits had to check in their needles on the way in uh, each day and then count them out again because a lost mm. needle in space would be a disaster. So there are these different cultures Because they were clashing. worried they'd leave it in the That's right, yeah, 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 yeah. Which, you know, if that happens in a, a j jacket you're Probably. wearing on stage, who yeah. cares? Uh, on the moon, uh, more of a problem. What's that you, really interesting amazing piece of rock that we've got orbiting the earth that we know lots about that's right yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> just checking. because we partly because we checking. went there whereas yeah. we haven't been to the right. deep ocean very sure, often sure. Don't yeah they get never me bother started. do they they can't be bothered to do it um <laughs> But I'm, I am fascinated in, in the forgotten stories because Stephen Jay Gould talked about the fact that it, he didn't revere Einstein too much because he thought of all the Einsteins working yeah. in the fields. And by doing this piece, and as you said, mm. well, by class alone, this gives you an advantage. But all those people who may well not have been in that class but are still contributing, as you started to research further into this book, did you get a, a tremendous sense of, of lost history that may well never really be retrieved? Um, yeah, and as you're talking about this, like I actually can feel this sadness, disappointment, like in my body with all of these people that we're never going to know about. And you know, yes, I've found great stories that I've included in my book, particularly in my newest one, but ultimately they are still written about in some way. There are still some scholars out there who have found evidence of their work or whatever, and there are just these countless people that we will never hear of. Um, and this is why, I mean, I also find it really fascinating, particularly with all the discord now about, you know, again, do you talk about society and the connections, toppling over statues, for example, where we're talking about, oh, we're erasing history, rewriting history. It's like, no, a huge swathe of history has already been erased and rewritten over. And we've lost all of that just because of the people who had the power to write the history in the first place. Um, and all of this is very, very relevant to the second person that I will talk about um, shortly. But but 100%, and I think, I think all of us need to really, really question... Um, these people that we hold in such high regard, like I, I've done some research on Alexander Graham Bell and I talk about the telephone. Did we know that he was part of the eugenics mo movement? Um, do we talk about that? Probably not. And, you know, he wanted to basically kind of breed deaf people out of society, even though his mother and his wife were both deaf. He didn't want anyone to learn ASL, like American Sign Language, because he thought that's doing deaf people a disservice and that deaf people shouldn't intermarry and all, all sorts of really questionable things and I think I think we just need to question and ask ourselves yes that person did some incredible science or engineering but there there's a very big story should we be kind of deifying them in the way we sometimes do
But there's a resistance, isn't there, to complicated stories because we want our heroes to be perfect. And, and so if there's anything that suggests that perhaps they weren't perfect, well, we mustn't talk about it because it somehow spoils it, when actually it just shows that they were human. And, yeah. and we can criticise their mistakes, like you said, as well as, you know, but it's like this, we're so, we're so sort of sold the idea, probably th just the nature of being human, but we want heroes we can completely commit to. And we don't want to know about the little wrinkles because it's sort of uncomfortable. Mm. Yeah. Well, I know, I think in, in one of the shows, we we're going to be talking about Schrodinger a little bit, which is, of course, you know, that story now is uh, and all of it kind of in plain sight as well so chris who is your uh first person who's inspired your work or indeed you well i'm going to start with somebody i had a antagonistic relationship with despite the fact that he died uh long before i was born and this is edmund halley uh who was the second astronomer royal and an oxford astronomer um and he got on my nerves um, for two reasons. <laughs> One is we had a marvellous event in 2004. We had the first transit of Venus in living memory, memory, where Venus goes in front of the sun. And these things happen in pairs, about eight years apart, and then not for more than a century. So probably no one watching this will ever see one because the next one's in 2120 or so. No, actually, we're getting to the point where somebody might be able to, to see the next one, but you're going to have to eat vegetables and stay healthy. Um, so um, in the build-up to 2004, we were getting ready to televise this and talking about it. And one of the questions that kept coming out, up was, are transits of Venus useful? And the answer is really not anymore. But at the time, and in fact, going back to the 19th, 18th and 17th centuries, um, they were a way of measuring the scale of the solar system. If you could time them precisely, then you could understand the distance to Venus and then thence to the sun and so on. And, and this is what Halley did for his research. He was essentially, essentially trying to get better predictions and better senses of the scale of the solar system. And I'd been happily telling people for months that this was a way of measuring the scale of the solar system. And then somebody went, how? How exactly do you use, more than I've just said, how do you use a transit Venus? And I didn't know. And then I asked some people at work, and they didn't know either. And it does a whole day of an astrophysics research department was reduced to people scribbling on whiteboards going, OK, so if we know this... and Anyway, so that's all Halley's fault. <laughs> um, and then uh, shortly after that, I ended up in Oxford uh, as a postdoc. And my first year in Oxford was really tough. Um, I fell out of my depth. Uh, um, I didn't really know what science I was supposed to be doing. I had an inkling that the science I was supposed to be doing, which was about the chemistry of star formation in distant galaxies, was something that, A, no one else cared about, and B, um, was actually impossible. <laughs> uh, it turned out it was also C, wrong, but I only found that out later. Um, and I had a boss, a guy called Joe Silk, who's a brilliant cosmologist, invented something called silk damping, which doesn't sound like cosmology. Um, something a spider would do. Exactly. Maybe it is. We should name these things. Uh, but he would come into my office at 2.30 every day and have an idea at me. And I didn't know what to do about this, so I wrote the ideas down. And so I ended up with this, uh, what I thought was a steadily growing to-do list, <laughs> which panicked me. And every morning I'd walk past Edmund Halley's house and I'd kick the pillar of it because I thought, this is the person they should have employed, you know, the next Halley. And they've got me and all I've got is a to-do list um, and deep ins insecure feelings about transits of Venus. Um, and so it's kind of difficult to know what to do with this. Eventually I realised, because Joe came in while a friend was studying for a driving test and he had an idea about that instead of about cosmology and I realised he was just talking out loud and I could <laughs> ignore him and that was fine. And then we did this project that you mentioned in the intro, which was uh, the Zooniverse, but initially Galaxy Zoo, where we had people looking at, people from all over the world going online and looking at galaxies um, and classifying them by their shape. And this became what I did, this sort of citizen science, setting up a way for everyone to contribute. And I thought, you know, I should learn the history of the subject. I should go back and see who was the first person to do this. And the first person successfully to do a citizen science project, as far as we could tell, was Edmund Halley, who in 1715 worked out that the track of a solar eclipse was going to cross the centre of Great Britain, of England, in fact, London was on the track, so it was Cambridge and Oxford. And he issued maps which you could buy for, I think uh, it was a penny at the time, which was expensive, but a sort of a pamphlet that gave you his prediction, which he said would be better than other people's because he understood the solar system better. But then it asked for observations. He asked for timings for people um, to send in and help him improve his models. And it worked. About 200 people sent in their timings. He observed it from on the roof of the Royal Society in London, and they saw the eclipse. 
Um, in Cambridge, um, too many people turned up to the observatory, so they didn't bother taking any uh, observations. And in Oxford, it was cloudy. Um, so they actually needed all of this information coming in uh, to Halley, and he published his revised scale of the solar system based on citizen science. So he got there first, and there's much else admirable about him, but um, his sort of setting up of this sort of astronomy where you take observations, think creatively about them, and then map the universe is something I've ended up doing. So now I go past and I pat the pillar of his <laughs> house and I say sorry, um, and, and hopefully we're friends now. Could we just do one retake? Could you say, say that he observed it from the roof of the Royal Institution in London? Because the two don't get on, and we're recording there. <laughs> well, uh, we, we, we could do that, but uh, the Royal Institution... Uh, uh, and, and it doesn't matter if it's wrong. I think, um, I think Halley would be upset with that kind of... He was, he was a committed person to truth. I also found out there's a story that people tell about him where he was rich, so he was the son of a soap boiler. Um, which is apparently a lucrative trade. If people know more about the 17th century than me, I'd love to know what, how you make money I, out of soap like boiling. Bubbles. something to do with whales and... Oh, maybe. Yeah. I assume it's producing the soap rather than just boiling it. I would think so. <laughs> you know, some sort of grand entertainment. Do people go out and watch soap boiling in the... Full of bubbles. Yeah, you see. You'd... Great. Are they interesting bubbles? All bubbles are interesting. Okay, fine. Are they understood bubbles? Well, I wouldn't have a job if they were. Okay, we need to go and boil some soap. Anyway, so he's had this, had this independent income, and the story is that he was working on trying to understand gravity. He went to Cambridge to see Newton, who basically told him that he'd actually got it all sorted. And one of the things I really admire about Halley is that he didn't come back and say, oh, you know, Newton's wrong or all my life has been wasted. He just went, great, how can I help you? And Newton said, well, you know, they ended up with a deal where Halley took on the responsibility for publishing the Principia, which is Newton's great masterwork of gravity, at his own expense. And I'd always assumed this was because he was rich, but the year before, he'd actually lost most of his money. His, his father had died and unexpectedly hadn't left a lot of money, I assume because his father's soap boiling, had the, the bottom had gone out of the soap boiling <laughs> bubble or something. Um, and, and so, but he committed to his, his colleague... And he went through with that and spent pretty much a lot, almost all the money he had on getting the Principia out into the world. And I think that sort of generous response to somebody else having an idea is what we want out of science. And it's actually on a rainy Tuesday when you're grumpy, quite difficult to do when somebody else has looked at the galaxy that I want to look at or somebody else has had the idea that I've just had the week before. It's very difficult to go, that's great, we now know something we didn't. It's much easier to say, oh, they're wrong or stupid or cynical or whatever. Um, and so a bit of Halley in that sense is useful too. How much do you see that in science, the history of science and in contemporary science? That Because I know some scientists who have this lovely idea that uh, all scientists are just going, oh yeah, oh no, I was wrong. And they kind of dismiss the idea that science, like everything else, includes human ego. And of course, we've seen that, you know, Fred Hoyle would be a good example of someone who was both a brilliant scientist, but didn't really didn't want. I remember you once telling me that you felt he didn't want to believe in the Big Bang because it actually ultimately affected kind of ideas of, well, the, the idea of things being finite. That's right. It creates a creation, which you then have to explain. And Hoyle was one of the last people clinging to the steady state theory. Um, I think that's right. And I think that goes right back. There were arguments. Halley got into all sorts of arguments with Flamsteed, who was the first astronomer royal, who was still writing years later that Halley's observations at Greenwich weren't as good as his, you know, and, and this sort of thing. So there, there is um, rivalry and, and upset, and, it, and people get attached to their ideas. People um, want to believe that they're right. They want to claim credit for those things. That's a lot of what drives many scientists. But I do think it varies in area, Though I think it, you know, there are places where people are motivated by winning the prize. Like in my world, I talk to cosmologists, people trying to determine the fundamental theories of the universe, and they tend to be much more competitive for some reason than people trying to understand star formation. And I don't really know why that is, but there's some sorting going on. I think pe maybe people who believe that they might be the person to crack the fundamental theory of how the universe works need a bit of ego. Whereas I like pottering around and trying to understand a bit about how galaxies work. And if we all do that collaboratively, then that's rather nice. 
Oh, I love that. You're just pottering around. What are you doing? Just pottering around the garden, checking on the sky. That's right. We yeah, did yeah. that lovely gig, didn't we, in Northampton, where we, ju- we just did this gig literally in a, in a back garden, someone's back garden, just with an audience of 12. Yeah. And we just looked at, and there was beautiful things, like as, as it got to, it was, it was just kind of post-dusk, wasn't it? And we looked up and there was the ISS going past and then it and vanished and then it vanishes yeah because it's got no sun reflecting off it at a certain yeah. point and now we look back and we wish we could have timed it and just gone the ISS I do not want it to exist <laughs> and in Northampton it's quite easy to become a wizard Indeed. So, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. is that the voice of experience oh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it nearly happened to me I got out just in time but I think that's right it's that 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 motivation of of looking at the sky and Halley was was an observer as well he was somebody who um, went to the southern hemisphere and, and created the the first proper catalog, um, scientific catalog using modern telescopes of the southern sky. And so till then, we only had half the hemisphere to look at. And so um, he understood the purpose of observations. He then um, fell out, he ended up commandeering a, or being given a command of a Royal Naval ship to go and work out how compasses work around the world, um, sailing on the oceans, and um, had to come back because none of the crew believed that a scientist could command a vessel. And so he ended up sailing back to London and trying to prosecute them in in court. Uh, And eventually he was given a a Royal Naval rank so that this wouldn't happen again. And they sent him back off to go and think about compasses for a bit longer. Well, they don't let scientists uh, captain ships today. It might be his job. It might Might be be his his fault. fault. Yeah, yeah, that's right. We tried it once. (laughs) Yeah, didn't work again. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) So, Roma, who's your second uh, inspiration? So um, you've already mentioned Newton. So I'm going to assume we all know who Newton is. Um, how many know, how many of us know who Snell is? Physicists in the room. He's got a law. Yeah. Got He's a got law. a law. Yeah. Yeah. So so I guess you know where I'm going to go with this is that that law should not be called Snell's law first of all, and the um, actual father of optics, at least from my perspective and the research that I've been doing, is a man called Ibn Al Haytham, and he was one of the Islamic scholars during the Golden Age of Science. Um, in the Middle East, better known as the Dark Ages in Europe. So we think, ooh, nothing happened in 1000 AD. Um, But actually, incredible science was happening in the Middle East. So Ibn al-Hitham was born in 965 CE in Basra in Iraq, just to kind of place us. And he was always pretty good at maths and science and kind of could see himself in that sort of area. Uh, He was a polymath. So this, I'm talking now, this is pre-enlightenment, right? This is way pre the kind of European polymath and the Renaissance and all, all of that kind of stuff. None of that existed at this time. He was a polymath. He decided to design a big civil engineering project, which was a dam for the River Nile in Egypt, because he could see that this was causing a lot of problems. Um, went there, realized that this problem was far more complicated and bigger than he could have imagined. And basically in fear for his life, he feigned madness and got imprisoned for 10 years. Um, Cause you're just like, oh, I can't do this and I'm gonna get killed if, if, I, if I admit that. <clears throat> so he ended up in prison for 10 years and did a lot of thinking. The ruler of Egypt then disappears and he gets released and then he comes out and just starts publishing all this incredible work. So he wrote the book, what is called the Book of Optics, um, which is the English translation from Arabic. He was also considered the first scientist So he says that his religion, Islam, encouraged him to question everything and made him feel responsible for basically questioning everything that was recorded by the Greeks, by the Romans and and so on. And he was was the first person to collect data, make observations, come up with a theory, test it and so on in what we kind of understand as being modern science. And then the reason I wrote about him was because I've, I've got the lens as one of my fundamental inventions. He was the first person that figured out. So, I mean, this seems really, really bleedingly obvious to us, to us now that light and our eyes exist independently. But then the Greeks were telling everyone that our eyes kind of shoot out lasers and then they bounce back. There are some amazing illustrations of right? this, like diagrams of how this happens. So maybe you so can on. explain to me, like, how did the Greeks then explain that we can't see in the dark? 
I don't like. I don't kind of follow the logic. But the dark is a, in that sort of philosophy. The dark, it's not my experience. But the dark is a thing. Is a thing separate. Is a thing from separate light. from that, right? So okay. you're in the dark. You're actually in a thing, right? Which has like the, the property ether. of preventing the light mm. from being emitted. Fascinating. Yeah, yeah. But that blindingly obvious thing. I mean, that's you. You look at the 19th century and you think, you know, there were people going. I hardly think that just because I'm a surgeon with my hands caked with diseased mm. blood before <laughs> I uh, managed to deliver a baby, I hardly. think think that my dirty hands have anything to do with the woman dying shortly afterwards and that now seems utterly utterly <laughs> preposterous doesn't it just wash your hands well i don't think that's going to be the issue one that gets me is plate tectonics in geology because yeah. none of geology makes any sense and that's 60s is it yeah you know 1960s so yeah yeah so, um, so i mean so he he basically was the first one to figure out that light and sight are separate so he drew a cross section of an eye he postulated that there's a lens in there he said light travels in straight lines he said it has a finite speed. He says that if you've got two rays of light crossing, they don't interfere with each other. They allow each other to just kind of go off and do their thing. He also understood that the speed of light varies in different materials, hence his work with lenses. He got the reason why that happens wrong, because again, I'm trying to do that thing where we don't just say, oh my God, what an incredible person who got everything right. Um, but he also then experimented with the pinhole camera, the camera obscura, and that's how he proved that light travels in straight lines. Um, and then he also understood aberrations. So, you know, the, the spherical lens, spherical aberrations and the other one that I can't remember. Everything, ev chromatic aberrations. Chromatic aberrations. Everything he, that ruins telescopes, Everything basically. that ruins telescopes. Um, he was into his spherical aberrations and even suggested, you know, so it's... I, and I had never heard of him. I have a degree in physics from Oxford. Um, never heard of him until about two years ago. And was it, talk, talk to us a little bit about the culture that he grew up in, because there was an age, you know, as you said, the, the dark ages is a problematic term because yeah. it just hides stuff. Well, maybe that's why it's, you know, mm -hmm. maybe it's deliberate. Mm -hmm. But um, the, the environment, the, there was a huge amount of science in the Arab world that, you know, they calculated things, they thought about things. It, he, he was a brilliant man, but he wasn't an anomaly, presumably, in his time. He was not. So, so we talked about Snell very briefly with the law. And so Snell's law should be called the Ibn Sahel law, because Ibn Sahel was one of his contemporaries that figured figured out the angles. He did it in a different way. He did it geometrically. And so there's an image that has now been found by um, a scholar in Islamic history who found like one piece of the document in Egypt and another piece of the document in Syria has finally put them together. Um, and obviously all of this work predates Newton by at least yeah. 700 years. We'll, we'll fix this in the Oxford course. I will Please. go back and we will Please. teach second year optics. We'll put this in. Jesus Christ. <laughs> um, and... And so, so yes, 100%. So this was an age, like when we think of like the Renaissance in Europe, this was, this, this was that in the Middle East. But I think partly because of the religion, because of Islam and our modern view on the religion or understanding of it, it's obviously changed in a thousand years. Um, I think partly because we have this impression that what, the Islamic scholars did was to take ancient Greek texts and so on and translate them, we take away their, their credit, I suppose, or their recognition of the new work that they did. And we think of them as, oh, they, they preserved Western knowledge and then gave it back to us when these civilizations died. Yes, that was only a part of what they did. Um, and then there are incredible stories of the women as well. There was a woman called Miriam Astrolabe, who used to design and make astrolabes. Am I saying that right? Yeah. 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 Um, and she, she was one of the, she used to make it for, you know, the rulers of, at the time. And so again, there's, there are just, I think there's so many stereotypes, assumptions, and like focus on focus, no pun intended, on, on the kind of the dark ages in Europe or European science and so on that we've, we kind of completely miss out on this huge portion of history. And I'm very glad that you're going to go... Yeah, and, and, the, and the cultures were in connection. It's not that it was, like you said, it was not preserved over here and brought back. It was, these were cultures in connection with each other and people in the West were aware of these developments. And when things turned up in our science, they came from these mm -hmm. antecedents that came from other parts of the world. So yeah, but then I wonder how much, like, I don't know whether, I, I don't know the answer to this, but does Newton write about the fact that he looked at Ibn al-Hitham's work in, when he was doing his work? I, I'm I, don't, pretty, I don't know enough don't Newton. Know. Newton doesn't often give credit to anyone for anything. <laughs> uh, That's a whole other yeah, well, yeah, coming, coming back to Halley, I forgot to say that there is a story that Peter the Great 
uh, the Russian Tsar came to England and wanted to hang out with Newton. And everyone told him this was a bad idea because Newton was antisocial. So he ended up with Halley in a wheelbarrow in Deptford after an evening involving lots of brandy. This is apparently a real story. <laughs> I mean, I'm, but, I'm thinking but, of when I was at Oxford and I'm sure there were wheelbarrow students in wheelbarrows. So right, yeah, yeah. Change. But the point really was that Newton is not your person not to go to for, to for proper citation. <laughs> uh, is there something interesting? So, I, I mean, I might, you might be able to correct me here, but I feel like I've read somewhere that one of the reasons... You know, there's this kind of thing that you, you, in order for things to be remembered in history, of course, you need cultures to be recognised. But you also need, uh, you know, sometimes techno technological development to be kind of on their side. And I seem to remember reading that, that the skills in grinding glass were, were one of the things, because once you have microscopes and telescopes, you can suddenly check things. You can do experiments in much more detail. And, you know, the grass gla glass grinding, I, I, don't, I can't remember, it was somewhere in the Netherlands, perhaps they might have developed that. But once you had lenses... Mm -hmm then you could sort of go further. And, and is it, I mean, was there a point where, you know, the Arabic culture of these ideas, it grew and then it got to the point where there was kind of, you couldn't do any more with the technology that was available. And do you know why it sort of didn't keep going out, keep developing? Um, so I, I believe it's true. So I, like I have to say, I'm not an expert in the Islamic Golden Age of Science. There are people there are out there who know tons more than me. I'm just trying to highlight a story. Um, my understanding is that they developed a lot of the science and the theory behind lenses, but the practical aspect of it um, developed in Europe later. Um, I don't know the reason for it, but from my experience of reading lots of other stories and researching lots of other stuff, it comes down usually to politics. So it's like the, co the formula for concrete or Roman concrete was lost for a thousand years once the Roman Empire fell, which was not nothing to do with concrete in itself, but then we've lost kind of the science of it or whatever. Yeah, and the lenses were a military technology. So they were developed in sort of that 15th century because people wanted to be able to see what was coming over the horizon as your fleet started sailing further. Um, so so there's a reason why the telescope pops up in about three or four different countries almost simultaneously mm -hmm. because there's an arms, literally an arms race going on. So there's that cultural thing that drives technology as, as well. Yeah. We'd better move on for the final... Uh, one. Uh, Chris? Who are you going to choose? So I want to talk about a woman who I think was very much the Robin Ince of her day. Um, in that she... Is this going? <laughs> being a Trapped in her own knitwear. I mean, pretty close, yeah. I think. This is Agnes Clark, who I think is uh, the greatest historian of astronomy and writer about astronomy that there's ever been. Um, and she wasn't a professional astronomer by background. She was um, self-taught. She grew up in Ireland, um, and she was home educated, but in a home that had a chemical lab and a telescope in the garden through which she observed Saturn and Jupiter. And then she had a career. She went um, and lived in Dublin for a while where she had piano lessons from James Joyce's piano teacher. Which I thought was quite nice, um, and then lived in Florence, where she spent 10 years, as far as anyone can tell, um, reading in the library. Um, that's what she did with her time in Florence. Uh, she's vaguely social, but mostly hung out in the library and read particularly astronomy. And she, uh, while she was there, started a career as a writer. Um, she wrote her first two published articles, and one of the reasons she reminds me of you is the breadth of knowledge. So her first two published articles that she got paid for, one was on uh, the great astronomer Copernicus and his ideas about how the development of his ideas that the Earth was not the centre of the solar system. The other one was on the development and history of the Sicilian Mafia. Um, so you can see those are very similar topics. I mean, we're back to scientists with egos. Uh, then she starts writing for the Encyclopedia Britannica, they're publishing at the time, so she picks up in G, she does Galileo, uh, she does lots of mathematicians, beginning with L, including Laplace, and it's a very mathematical and detailed article, so she had some uh, mathematical chops. And then there's this gap, she doesn't appear in the encyclopedia until she gets Z for Zodiac uh, right at the end, and during that gap, she wrote a book called A Popular History of the Development of 19th Century Astronomy. And this was a book that I found when I was 18 in a bookshop, and I think it made me the communicator I am because it is remarkable. So for starters, it's called a popular history and it explains in the introduction that it's, uh, it's aimed for the lady reader 
who would like to understand astronomy. And at the time, that would have signified that this was a low-level textbook. Uh, and actually, in every chapter, say the chapter on Mars, she has a sentence which is something like, as you know, Mars is the fourth planet from the sun and it's red. The latest research on Mars, and then she, it's essentially a gazetteer of that moment and it's referenced, so there are footnotes, so everything she says has a reference and it's, the cu it's basically the cutting edge of science at the time. And the reason that it's so exciting is she realised something that the astronomers hadn't, which is that there had been a revolution in astronomy in the last half of the 19th century and it was a revolution driven by the fact that we could understand stars because somebody had invented the spectroscope. So suddenly we knew what stars were made of for the first time, um, and we knew how far away some of them were, and we knew that the sun was a star, and she was corresponding with lots of these astronomers. And so she calls it the new astronomy, but she's really talking about the birth of astrophysics, of trying not to map the stars, but to actually understand the science of what's going on in the heavens um and it's a huge hit this book sells like anything um and it gets revised over the 20 years of her life she revises it four times and she takes sides as, as she goes on she starts to take sides in the big debates and in particular one of the arguments going on at the time is about whether our galaxy the milky way is the whole universe or whether it's one of many many universes and they know that there are these things called Spot nebulae, little blobs that aren't stars. and Some of them look kind of fuzzy and some of them look like spirals. And so there's an argument as to whether these are in the galaxy or whether they're distant galaxies. And she takes a very firm stand and she writes this marvellous sentence, which is, this was in the 1904 edition. She says, the idea of galaxies beyond our own is a long forgotten and discredited hypothesis. And at the time I thought, A, that's lovely writing. B, how cool it is that she's engaged in this debate that would be settled 20 years later. And, and C, how nice it is to see that she could, I realised that she could be a science communicator and a participant, even though she was self-taught. And so it's this role that mixes up having opinions about science, doing science to some extent, um, writing about it and communicating the cutting edge. And I realised for the first time when I looked at this book that I could maybe try and do all of the, these things. But the autodidact thing is very interesting, I, th I think, because it, it made me, when you were talking about her, it make, makes me think about Jane Goodall. Mm. Because I always think, you know, Jane Goodall here was someone who really changed our perception of uh, chimpanzee behaviour, of all the... and But when she then moved into I think when she went to Cambridge there was a lot the way that she was kind of patronized and that she hadn't followed the right rules and you don't give you know the chimpanzees names like David Greybeard that's again um, and I wonder how much you know those autodidacts who because they're not within they, they, they haven't had their perception or the rules narrowed down yeah. which allows them to then go in places where had Agnestock gone through traditional education, had Jane Goodall been trained, you know, trained as such, then those discoveries might not have occurred. Yeah, and it's a sort of early version of the, if one isn't careful, then a scientific career can be a narrowing one. Like you end up, you get into science because you're interested in astronomy. And by the end of my PhD, I was the world expert on sulfur in distant galaxies because no one else cared. Um, and so because she stood slightly outside that structure, the reviews of her books at the time talked about the fact that no one else had read as much. No one else had the breadth. And there's a later book that wasn't as popular as the, the history and, and is less well remembered now, which was called something like Progress in, Astro, in, Progress in Astronomy. And it's her chiding the astronomers. And she says, look, I've read all the papers. One of the big things at the time was working out why stars vary in brightness. And she said, look, I've read all the papers. None of you are talking to each other. I can see that if you'd use this technique on these stars, then you'll really discover something. And lots of her suggestions are really germane and useful. And they were read and taken up by what were then professional astronomers, but they needed somebody from outside to look at the field and see where the gaps were. And how did she get access to the papers? Because, you know, even now we have debates about scientific papers being behind closed walls and, you're only, you know, university subscriptions still for some of them. So how did someone who has that background, who isn't part of how does she even get in there? So, so to begin with, it's really difficult. And she writes the history without any astronomers really knowing who she was or what she was doing. They spot some of the articles she writes uh, are spotted by other astronomers, and but 
event in the tradition of the time in things like the Edinburgh Review, you were anonymous as a writer. So there were people speculating who wrote this stuff. So um, she has correspondence with a couple of astronomers in particular who she knows through um, connections at the British Library reading room where her and her sister, who was a poet, used to go all the time. And the, the keeper of the reading room would say, oh, well, if you're interested in astronomy, you should talk to this person. So you had two friends who sent her lots of stuff. And then after that, there's a long battle to get into the institution. So um, she wants to go to meetings of the Royal Society. She wants to go to meetings of the Royal Astronomical Society. And in both cases, she's not admitted because she's not uh, male. And um, over time, they... Um, get themselves to the grudging position where maybe it would be all right if women came to the meetings and used the library if they weren't actually fellows or members. She's later made the third um, uh, female member of the Royal Astronomical Society, but that's much later. So, yeah, she does need to get into these institutions, but she relies on the generosity at the beginning of a couple of people who could see the value in what she was doing. Well, isn't that such a great... You know, aren't libraries wonderful? Yeah. Right? The, the, the concept of all, all the things in a place and you can walk in and, you know... Won't and you let happen, everyone in, and you right? Because they didn't say, yeah. well, where's your degree or have you done any spectra recently? Yeah. Um, people start trying to convert her to an observer because one of the criticisms of the, the history is that she hasn't... It's obvious that she hasn't looked through a telescope very much. And so she gets an invite to the observatory in South Africa and, and the... I think Gill is the guy's name. He says, look, come down here, live here, we'll turn you into an observational astronomer. And she sort of doesn't want to go, but then does. Uh, she gets lots of material for other articles about life in South Africa and, and, and so on. Um, and she spends a few months down there learning, being trained to use a modern telescope, um, which she studies... Um, things like the marvels of the southern sky. No one's used a spectroscope in the south before. And so Eta Carini, which is the star that's about to explode, um, she gets one of the first spectrum of. And then she comes back here, and Greenwich try and give her a job um, and say, look, we'll give you a telescope. During the day, you can be um, paid as a computer, which is the people who process the, the data was a very low-level job. But then we'll give you a telescope, and you can do what you want with it. But she turns them down because Greenwich Park isn't safe because you'd have to walk through Greenwich Park on your own and just let yourself in and out with a key. And so she turns them down because she doesn't see how it can be practical. Um, but there's this alternative history where she gets access to all the telescope time she wants and discovers wonderful things about stars. I love that when you just talk about the library and all the knowledge. I, was, I went to Exeter Public Library, the central one, uh, about a month ago. And they said, do you want to come down to the archive? And I said, yes, of course. And it, just seeing the stuff that was held there, you know, and people might, might think it was like, you know, books made by William Morris, actually made by William Morris. And, these were, and, and then there were things like um, all the copies of Nature. And you find out that Nature actually began, the first issue starts with a poem uh, about the scientific journey and the nature of colour and light by Goethe. And you're like, going, wow, to start with poetry. And then I've, I read, I think her name was Lady Bell, something like that. And she wrote, again, in Nature, about, you probably know about this, suffragitsu. You know the suffragitsu? That's well, great well, word, su isn't it? Suffragitsu was basically, it, it, was, it was meant to be used as a kind of insult, but it wasn't. It basically, suffragettes learnt jujitsu because it turned the, uh, uh, you know, the power of your enemy against them. Mm -hmm. And as they would often be, you know, slighter than the bee. And it's like suffragettes. And she, so there's a whole article with illustrations of what to do. And it's like that bit where you just, again, it opens up this incredible world. And you see quite often, you know, the past enriches the future. And, and it's possible. Nature was a magazine. It was supposed to be read by everyone, not a journal. And Clark was one of their astronomy writers for years early on. Oh, I just love it. Yeah, this is, this is definitely a <laughs> podcast for uh, people who, if you don't belong to a library, go and join the library. There's uh, fantastic things there. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Roby, can, can you, uh, I don't think you ever actually said the title of your book, and we should make sure that we... Thank you. It's Nuts and Bolts, Seven Small Inventions That Changed the World. And you actually, didn't you have a, a nail made in this building? I heard... I did. There may have been a nail forged about two months ago um, in front of about 200 people. <laughs> But I heard that the, the, the person who did that was really excited. You know, you would, you would think it would actually went, oh, my goodness, I'm actually going to make a, a, a nail. I gave poor Dan something like 48 hours notice that maybe I want to forge a nail on Thursday. And he just, he just went for it. And somebody was saying to me that there was like just banging in the building one evening. And was like, what is going on? It's like Dan's forging a nail. I'm like, okay, fine. 
that makes sense. That's fantastic. And and Chris, your book is uh, is still available, isn't it? The, uh, the yes, we've got book. Crowd in the Cosmos, and then there's a new book out in February, which is called Our Accidental Universe, and it's about how astronomers don't know what we're doing. <laughs> well, there seems to be a real. Happy. There's a lot more science, right? Uh, uh, there's been quite a few about neuroscience. Matthew Cobb's brilliant book where he basically says, you know, when people say how far we've advanced with understanding the brain, we've got nowhere at all. And uh, so it's very good for the younger generation, very inspiring. For the older generation, it reminds them of their repetitive failure, uh, which is uh, as does he. We're, we're back to ego again. Yeah, also, exactly. It's good for the soul to be reminded of failure. And Helen, your new book, uh, Blue Machine, is. Uh, you're doing an event at the Royal Institution, which may well be in the past by the time we uh, uh, actually mention it. And I'll be doing book talks all summer. You know, there is, I think, the summer. next night, though, it, or it might even be actually clashing with the thing all about the moon and how much we know about it. And, and I just think it would be a pity if, because uh, it seems like your book's just I a load of conjecture it, about this multi sphincter animals. This is personal. I'm watching who yeah. turns up to yeah. the moon and the ocean one. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. And uh, a reminder that uh, we, we're going to try and make sure that all of these things are freely available to absolutely everyone. So if uh, so, if you do happen to go, I have some spare cash, then it would be wonderful if you go to patreon.com slash cosmic shambles uh, so we can make sure that everyone who doesn't have that uh, can listen to all of this series and the other things that we make. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you to everyone at the Royal Institution for uh, joining us. And bye-bye. Uh, <laughs>hope you enjoyed that and we've got loads of other new ideas coming up we've got quite a few things that we've made already and we've got plans to make a lot more things and if you can help it would be great if you could go to patreon.com slash cosmic shambles to help fund all of our big ideas and some of our quite small ideas and if you can't afford to that's absolutely fine as well obviously we want to make these things as free as possible for as many people as possible but if you can subscribe there'll be a subscribe thing there or there or there, or there uh, that will be fantastic as well.